I want to continue our examination of uh, HTML elements. And I want to take a look at working with element types that are uh, working with element types that aren't basic text. So things where we need to do uh, rich media or interactive elements or tabular data. So I want to I want to show you how to work with tables. I want to talk a bit about multimedia. I'm going to focus on 2D graphics and working with images, but I'll also, you know, I'll, I'll mention about a video and audio as well. I want to talk about how to use scripts, how do you, how to write your own scripts and include JavaScript that you've written, how to integrate scripts that other people have written into your code. So I want to work through this. And what I thought I would do is I would just build up a simple example. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to work with some data from uh, the city of Toronto about COVID cases, and they have the data broken down by, um, by neighborhood or by uh, forward sortation, sortation area FSA. And so I'm going to, I'm going to basically look at the data for North York, Willowdale area, and I'm going to, I'm going to present it in a number of ways. So I've already built something. This is, what I want to build right now with you, I want to be able to work with images. I want to be able to represent the data in a table. And I also want to be able to build a graph of, um, of the data and, you know, an interactive graph down here. So we're going to use a bunch of JavaScript, HTML, et cetera, to, uh, to make this work. And, um, I'll switch my over to my editor here. So I've got a, I've got an editor open and I've got a blank page up and running and we can uh, we can start in on this. So th the first thing I, th I think we should do is we should work on the on the data. So whenever you have data that you want to display, which is rows and columns of data, you're going to need to reach for the table table element. So a, a table the first thing I should say about a table is that tables used to be used or misused to do layout. So we don't use tables for design of web pages. You don't use a table to create um, to create the look of a website. We use a table when we want to represent some kind of data to the user which needs to be put into a table. Um, so in this case, I want to be able to represent, you know, uh, two columns of data and I want to be able to have column headings and I want to be able to, you know, show the user very quickly this data in a format that is easy to easy to take in in tabular form. So a table is perfect for this. So the way that a table works, let's start working up this table. A table uh, is contained within the table element and there's uh, tables are not hard, but they have quite a few sub uh, sub pieces to them. Like you're going to use a bunch of elements in order to make these things work. Okay. So what I need to do is I need to create a table and I'm going to put everything in between my table. Now, the thing that I keep trying to emphasize whenever you have an element like this, I'm going to have an, a table element. The table element is going to contain other elements. Okay. So the table element is a block level element and it's going to contain other elements. Now I'm going to because I want my code to be readable, I'm going to make sure that my code is indented one tab stop over to the right so that anything that's in the table gets pushed over. All right, so what goes in a table? The most basic way to think about a table is that a table is made up of rows and rows are made up of columns. So let's just make a simple table here. I'm going to say uh, that I have a row. TR is table row. And inside my table row, I have a cell, a table cell. So a table cell is represented by table data, TD. And so this is data right here. Now, if I wanted to, let's say I have data one and I want to put another cell in the row, I would say TD data two. So if I save this, this is what it looks like. Data one, data two. So I want you to notice that my table doesn't look <laughs> just like all the rest of this HTML we're building right now. It doesn't look that great. Now at the end of this, I'm going to show you how I would use some CSS to clean things up. But for now, you're not worried about 
the fact that this doesn't look the way you want it to. Let me put in a few more rows here. So I have another row, another row, another row. So now I have four rows and each row has two table elements in it. So you can see that I'm starting to get the look of a table, this vertical stacking of, of columns and horizontal rows that go across. Now, as your data gets bigger, what I tend to do is I tend to put it on multiple lines. So if I was doing this table for real, what I would do is I would probably separate it out so it looks like that. Both of these, if I save this, it'll represent the data the exact same way when it renders it. So I would encourage you to make your tables so that they are easy to read as code. Because when you have to make changes to them or you have to work on the code, you don't want to try and fight with it. And this style here gets really, really hard to parse. Like if you just look at this quickly, you're going to have a hard time with it. Okay, so that's the simplest way that we can do a table is we can do rows of cells. Rows of cells, rows of cells, over and over and over. Now another thing we can do is in addition to having table cells, we can also represent table headings. So a heading would be something you'd put at the top or maybe at the bottom of a table to, to help the user know, okay, this is, this is what data one means. So if this here was a table heading, I would use TH instead of TD. TH, and this would be TH, TH. So I'm still in a row, table row, but I have table headings. And you'll see that the browser will, it will make these look a little bit different than the table cells. So it, in this case, it makes them bold. We could Using CSS later on, we could change it to look like anything we want. We're not limited to this. Okay. So let's actually start here. Let's, let's get rid of this data because this data is no good. And let's, in our very first row, what we would like to be able to represent is we need the age group and we need the number of cases. So COVID cases by age group is what we're trying to do here. Okay, so I'm going to say table table row inside here is a table heading and this is uh, age group and then I have another table heading so this is a column remember th and this is going to be cases and if we go back over here we have age groups and cases like so now Another thing we can do with our table as our tables get bigger is similar to the way that we do our HTML document. Like our document has a head and it has a body. You can do the same thing in a table. So what you can do is when you have sort of a complex table, you can say, I want to, I want to specify that this is the head of the table. So I'm going to move this top part into the head of the table. And then below that, you can put a um, body, body of the table. And you can actually, down at the bottom, you can put T foot for the footer of the table. So we can have a um, header at the top. We can have, this is uh, all the rows in the table. And this down here is the bottom bottom of the table. And you might say, well, why would we bother with this? And later on, when you want to make your table look nice, it's, it's convenient to be able to specify different sections of the table and say, this is the top, this is the bottom, this is the body, and then be able to specify how things are going to look. Okay, so let's go, with, let's go and add some data to our, our table. So what do we have in here? I'm going to add in a row. Whoops. So I have a row and inside the row, I'm going to put a table data. I'm going to say this is for unknown uh, age groups. And the data here is there was one person where they didn't know the age group. Unknown one, like looks like that. And let's do another one, table row. And here, uh, a common mistake that you'll make when you're getting started on this is you'll say under 19 like this, you'll do this. And you can see that this didn't do what we wanted it to do. And the reason is that we didn't put this inside of table data. 
So you have to remember that this goes in a row and then inside the row, you have to specify each one of your table cells, these table data uh, elements. Uh, okay, so this is under 19 and under 19, the count was 11 like this. And so we have uh, unknown, under 19 and so on. And what I'm going to do is instead of wasting your time, I'm going to copy and paste the rest of these in like this. So now I have rows for each one of these uh, different age groups, and I have the counts for each one of these like so. Okay, let's do another thing. So what I would like to do is across the bottom, I'd like to put a link to the data. So whenever you're using something from the web, you're using an image, you're using a data set, you are, uh, you're connecting parts of the internet. It's really important for you to use hyperlinks and to give credit. So here I want to link to the Toronto Public Health data so that if somebody was looking at this web page, they could go and find my raw data. Like, where did I get this data from? Well, it came from here. So I'd like to be able to put a row at the bottom in the footer. Like so, I'm going to say table row. Whoops, table row. Hold on. Table row. And inside the table row, I want to put a uh, TH like so. Now, I have a problem. Every other one of my, let me just put some in here, footer. So the problem I'm going to have here is that I want my TH, I want it to be um, underneath both of these columns. So I want this, instead of stopping right here, I want it to stretch all the way across here. And there's an easy way to do this in HTML. What we'll do is on any one of our table cells, you can say column span, or you can say row span. Column span or row span. And what that means is take this column and or take the take this cell and stretch it so that it fills whatever number you give it here. So if you say, in this case, I want to say column span equals two. So instead of filling just one column, I want it to fill two columns. Okay, so now what am I going to put inside of my TH? Well, in here, I want to say that the source of this data is, and it comes from, um, this is the uh, Toronto Public Health Open Data. And here I want to link to the URL that I got, where I got this data so that others can figure out, okay, how do I reproduce this? So I save that here. And now across the bottom of my table, you'll see that even though this is like two columns, it's just this thing has spanned one. So if you've ever worked in a spreadsheet, this is like merging cells in a, spread, in a spreadsheet. Uh, excellent. Okay, so this, this table looks pretty good. So tables, tables are useful when you want to represent data in a tabular form, like when you wouldn't put it in a paragraph or you want to make it so that it, it, it has this format. It's not about the way that it looks. You can make a table look like anything you want. I wrote a bit of CSS here, which we're going to be talking about CSS in the coming weeks. And I've written some styles for the way that I want this table to look. And if I was to apply this uh, to my, if I was to apply this style sheet to my uh, document, uh, rel equals, my table would look like this. So you can see that the data, the way that the data is structured in the markup has nothing to do with what it looks like. Like you can make your, your table look like anything that you want. So don't get hung up on the way that it looks, even though, you know, this, if I were to get rid of this again, this doesn't look great yet, 
But that's not what markup is about. Markup isn't how it looks. Markup is how it's structured. There's one last thing that I could do with my table that you might sometimes want to do, and that is you might want to put a caption on the table. And the caption is like cases by age group um, for M2N, for the FSA M2M. FSA M2M. And that puts this up at the top. You know, you have a caption at the top, and if I were to uh, style this, I could, I could essentially, I could label what my table is. So if you have a table in a document, you're saying this is what this table, this is what this table is showing. Okay, great. So that's working with tables. The only tricky thing we had to do here that we had to remember is you have to think in terms of table row. So a table row contains a table contains rows and a row contains columns, and your columns are either going to be table cells, which is like data, TD, or they're going to be TH, which are headings, table header. And the other tricky thing we did here was we used column span. So whenever you want, uh, you want one of these things to span multiple columns, you would do it. Like for example, if I wanted this, uh, this cell here to go down for two rows, so right here, if I said here that this is row span equals two, then down here, I wouldn't need this. So this is what it would look like. So you can see how this cell here now occupies two rows instead of just one row. And, um, whoops. Obviously I'm not gonna do that for this data, but that's how it works when you're trying to put this together. Okay, so let's keep adding things to this. So another thing that I want to add to this is <clears throat> I'd love to put a picture in here. So I did a search and I looked for a picture of uh, North York. Now you have to be really careful when you go on the web and you go searching for things because not every picture on the internet is something that you're, uh, you know, you're allowed to use. So like if I went to, um, If I typed in a uh, search for uh, North York and I did, let's see if we can find images of North York. So one of the problem is um, there's lots of pictures in here, but which one am I allowed to use? Like which one of these is suitable for me to use? So when you are um, doing a search, you can turn on your, I'm trying, where is it in, uh, let me remind myself here, is it tools? Yeah, okay, in tools. When you're doing a Google search, you can go to tools and then you can specify the usage rights. So by default, it shows you all pictures. But if you say that you want to see Creative Commons licensed images, if I click on this, now what I'm going to get back are images that I'm allowed to I'm allowed to use, and one of the ones that came up is this image right here. So a Creative Commons licensed image is one where you're allowed to. Well, I'll show you what I'm allowed to do here. So this image says I'm allowed to copy and distribute and transmit the work. So if I want to put it on my website, I can. I can remix it. So if I wanted to take this, put it in Photoshop, and change it somehow, I could do that. The only thing I have to do is I have to give credit, and um, I have to I have to say, all right, well, if I'm going to use this um, image, then I have to be careful about making sure that I uh, I give the proper credit for uh, for using this image. Okay, and you can see. So let's use this image. So you can see here. There's a link. It says I can download uh, various sizes. And here it gives me various different sizes that I can download, like let's say 1024, 20, uh, 2048. So it's interesting when you're thinking about using images on the web, what you wanna do is you want, to, you want to figure out what is the smallest version of this image that I could possibly use. So 2048 pixels, like let's, let's look at this image. So here's the image 2048 pixels, but if I expand it, this image is actually really big. Now imagine if I'm looking this at this image on a phone, and let's say that um, I only want the image to be about this big. It doesn't make sense to download the image uh, 
to download the image at that size because you know you're going to have to pay for all that data on your mobile plan or it's going to make your web page slower so what we're going to want to do here is we're going to want to pick a size that is as small as possible so we could say we could start out with an image that's a thousand pixels or 512 pixels or something like that and we could download that image so let's say we download this uh this image 512 pixels let me go back here or let me let, let's do uh let's say this size here whoops and let me reset this so here's the image now like this and i'll just uh save this image and save okay so now i have this image here and um i can work with it so it's downloaded it as a jpeg okay so let's start and let's use this image um I've saved the image into an images folder here. I have this North York uh, image here. I'm gonna put an image right here and I'm gonna say I have an image and the source of this image is images slash North York JPEG like this. Okay, so let's save that. And here's my web page now. So I've got a I've got an image that looks that's right here. Now I've got a number of things that I want to do to improve. Uh, improve this. The first thing that I'd like to do is I'd like to include some text that describes the image. So if somebody comes to my website and they're going through this website and they're using a screen reader or they have some kind of assistive technology where they can't see the images but they want to know what the image is, what, the, what this image is, then what I'd like to do is I would like to put in some text here so I'm going to say alt equals, and in my alt text, I'm going to say that this is uh, North York, downtown North York, like that. So I now have this extra bit of information in the image. It's not going to display here when I'm showing images, but for someone who doesn't have the ability to see the images, this is going to be the alternative text that they're going to get. So a screen reader could read that out or um, it can be used in other ways. All right, so that's working with it as an image. Now, um, let's go a little bit further. So I want, to, I want to show you something that's becoming really common on the web with all of these different media types. And that is being able to specify more than one file type. So, you can see with the audio or video, and I'm gonna show you the same thing with the picture element in a second. What you can do is you can specify that you have, so let's say for audio, you have a song and the song is either in MP3 format or it's in OGG format. Or you could say, I have a video that's in MP4 format or OGG or WebM. And the reason that browsers do this is because people use uh, browsers on all different devices and not every browser or device supports the same type of media uh, trans uh, media decoders. So there's actually a really cool site you can use called caniuse.com. So for web development this is a fantastic site because what it lets you do is it lets you do a search to figure out okay if I want to use a particular feature of the web which browsers support it. So for example, if I look up JPEG, let me see if I can get JPEG. Uh, do they have it? It's JPEG is so common they may not uh, they may not include it. No, they don't use it. So let me show you some other, let me show you these two other ones. A every browser supports uh, JPEG images. So that's a bad example. But what about this? Um, there's a new image format called, hold on. There we go. Uh, JPEG, uh, this is not, I wanna do WebP. Okay, here's WebP. So WebP is a new image format that Google has brought out and it, what it's really good for is it lets you have the same image but in a much smaller file size so it's faster to download. And you can see here that it shows me all the different browsers, Edge, Firefox, Chrome, Safari, etc. There's a lot of them over here. And each one of them, it gives version numbers. 
So for example, Firefox version 65 is when they started supporting uh, the WebP format. But you can see that, for example, Safari still doesn't support it. So the problem with some of these different media types is that not every browser can use it. Like if somebody is on an iPhone, they wouldn't have been able to use it until Safari version 14. So the latest version of Safari has added support to it, but older versions of, of Safari don't work. So we don't want to use an image format that everybody can't use. There's actually another uh, brand new one called AVIF. AVIF, what is wrong with my... AVIF is only supported in Chrome and Opera right now. You can see that it's not supported in Firefox at all. So if I wanted to use these, I'm going to have a problem because only 25% of users are able to, uh, globally, are able to use this, uh, use this image format. Okay, so what? let me show you how we can convert image formats. There's lots of apps on the web that will let you do this, but there's one that is kind of fun to use called squoosh.app. So what, it, what I can do here is I can take this image, this downtown North York image, and I can drag it into the browser and let go. And what it'll do is it'll give me the ability to um, compress this image. So what it says is it says the original image is 151 kilobytes. On the left, you can see the original image. On the right, I can do different kinds of image types. So for example, if I wanted to convert this into WebP, I would go over here and click on WebP. And you can see that it has made it 29% smaller. Okay. If I were to choose AVIF, it converts it and let's see. Working, working, working. It's 47% smaller, so it's 79 kilobytes. So here on the left and the right, you can see the difference between the two images. So over here, I've got the original image on the left. On the right, I've got the new modified version, and there's, there's no difference. You can't see the difference. So each one of these I can download. If I want to click on the download button, it'll download versions of those. And I've already gone ahead and done that. I downloaded um, AVIF, JPEG, and WebP versions of my images. So I have three different versions of the image. And what I'd like to be able to do is I'd like to be able to allow the user to use whichever uh, element type they want to use depending on what their browser supports. So there's in the notes this week, I linked to the um, picture element. And the picture element allows you to specify uh, multiple different sources, just like you would with a video or audio element. So let me show you what I would do here. I'm going to write a picture element right here. And I'm going to put the image element inside of um, I'm going to put it inside of the picture element. Now, this JPEG version is going to be my default. So if the user can't, if the user's browser doesn't support a particular file format, then they'll this will be the fallback or the default. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to also specify some other sources. So I'm going to say source. Source set is equal to um, images, and let's do the WebP version. So North York, uh, dot WebP. And the type of this file, the MIME type of this file, it's an image and it's a WebP image. And I'm going to do the same thing with source, source set equals images, North York, dot uh, avif type equals image slash avif and now what i've got is i've got um, three different versions of this image that can be loaded and if i save this the browser is only going to load one version of the image so if i were to um, take a look at what this image actually like what it actually loaded Let's reload this page and you'll see that my browser has loaded the WebP version of it because it supports the WebP version. So that's the one that it has it has taken. 
um, that's great. So it 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 allowed me to pick the most appropriate version for my browser, um, and I could put all of them in here. Now, do you always have to do this? No, you don't always need to include multiple versions of every uh, image the same way that we don't have to always do multiple versions of things like, like, do I always have to put multiple versions of a, an audio file? Well, you can ask yourself a question. Like for example, if I use an MP3 file, MP3 files are supported by 98% of browsers in the world. So there are a few browsers that can't render a, or can't play an MP3 file, like Opera Mini can't. So, if I was making a page today that had audio in it, I would probably just use MP3 because I know that it's gonna be usable by the vast majority of people. What about um, video? So if we go and look at video, MP4 is a common type for video. 98.2% of all browsers can, can play an MP4 uh, video. So, I would probably use that, right? Like, so you can decide what's important to you. You can, but I wanted you to see how we support multiple types. Um, and I would do this sometimes, like if I had a really big image on a page that I wanted to display, and it was, it was gonna take up a lot of bandwidth if I used the wrong one, I might use this technique. Okay, so one more thing that I'd like to be able to do here is I haven't given credit to this image yet. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna wrap this in a figure element. So I'm gonna take the picture and I'm gonna put it inside of my figure element. And then at the bottom, I'm gonna have a, a caption, a figure caption like so. And I'm gonna say, let's go back to the page here. Where is it? Here. So I'm going to, um, if I click on one of these, I think it was this one, I, whoops, that's not the right one. Uh, download all sizes, okay, here. So they've given me a really nice um, attribution line that I can use. And if I click on HTML, they even give me the HTML for it. So I'm gonna copy this and I'm gonna put that here. I'm gonna say photo by, and then I'm gonna paste this this in here like so. So let's save this and see how it looks. So this is nice, I have, I have the photo. The photo has credit at the bottom here. There's a link to where I downloaded this. So if somebody wanted to go and find this, and I'm saying which license I'm using this under, Creative Commons, uh, the version three by SA license. And I've done all of that in my markup using figure, picture, image, figure caption, I've got an anchor element for my href, etc. So that's really good. Easy to do. And um, HTML gives me all the tools that I need to be able to properly mark up this information so that the browser can use whatever it needs and so that the user has access to all the information they need to be able to go and work with this. Okay, so the next thing I wanna to talk to you about is uh, the last thing we have in here is about working with scripts. We have spent weeks learning about JavaScript and I wanna show you how you start to use JavaScript in a web page. Okay, so the way that you put JavaScript in a web page, there's a couple of options. One is to put in a, a script tag like so. And um, the script element can contain JavaScript. So for example, if I said console.log, hello world, and if I save this, and if I were to open up the console, go to the console, you'll see it says hello world on the console here, like so. So this is an example of what we call, this is uh, an inline script, meaning that the JavaScript is placed inside of the HTML page. For the most part, you want to avoid doing this. 
The main reason for avoiding this is that the browser is not able to cache this. So every time that the web page is loaded, it's going to have to reload this script because the script is in the HTML web page. If I put, if I move this to a separate file, then the browser can cache it. So let's do that. Let's put a second script in. So this is going to be an example of an external, an external script that's going to get loaded. So I'm going to, I'm going to do script again, but I'm going to say source is equal to uh, script.js like that. Now, if I were to run this right now, it's going to give me an error. It says script.js 404, can't find it. So there is no file called script.js. I have to make a new file called script.js. And in here, I'm going to say con uh, console.log hello from script.js. So now you can see I've got two things happening. It says, hello world. Hello world is running right here. And then it says, hello from script.js. What if I change the order of these? So if I rerun the page, you can see that the order of these two scripts has changed. So this page has multiple scripts in it. And those scripts are going to be executed. They're going to get parsed and executed in the order that you put them in the page. So if I put this script here, if I move this all the way up to the top and I put it up here, it's going to get executed up here at the top. Like it's going to get executed really early on in the loading of the page. This is going to become very important when we start talking about working with um, integrating JavaScript and HTML, I'm going to advise you to always put your scripts down at the bottom of the page, down here, like so, as opposed to up at the top of the page. And you'll see different people telling you different things. But if you put them down here at the bottom, all of this other HTML is going to get parsed first before the scripts. And so the scripts are going to get so they're going to get parsed and, and downloaded and run after all of this other stuff gets, gets parsed out. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about these scripts. I am going to put in another script here, an inline script, and I'm going to say let greeting equals uh, hello web222, like that. And down in this script, I'm going to say console.log greeting, like that. So when I run this, you'll see that it says hello web222 on the console. So what I want you to notice is that each one of these scripts, they have access to the same global scope. So anything that you do in one script, is going to happen in another script. So think about this for a second. What if I, so right now I'm loading this script file, then I'm, I have an inline script and then I have another inline script. So what would happen if I said here, what would happen if I said uh, var greeting equals um, hello from script.js? You can see that I have an error. I have an error because I'm trying to define greeting here, and then I'm trying to define greeting again here. So these two scripts, the variable is colliding. It's a problem. So you have to understand that it, within the context of this web page, everything you do in JavaScript is going to be accessible in every other function. So for example, if I were to write a function here, function greeting, and I put in uh, some text, and I say console.log uh, hello, and then whatever the text is, like this, that means that in my other functions down here, I could say 
uh, let's get rid of this for a second. Let's say here I would say um, greeting web 222 like this, and I'm gonna get rid of this one. So now you can see that it's printing out hello web 222. I've defined the script in one file. So this file never calls the script. It just defines it. I've declared the function, but I don't use the function. And over here, I use the function, but don't declare the function. So what I'm doing is I'm splitting up my code into different pieces. Some of it gets defined in one file, some of it gets defined in another file. And this is a really common thing you're gonna see in JavaScript and web development, where <clears throat> We're going to move certain parts of our program into scripts, and uh, then we're gonna use them in other places. And sometimes we're gonna write those scripts, and sometimes we're gonna load those scripts from other, other sources. So I wanted to show you an example of this right now because the source here can be, this is um, an external script to a local file, in other words, script.js, this, this is a relative URL. So it's loading script.js, which is beside index.html. That's why it works. But I could also put in here an absolute URL to be able to do this. So I told you that I wanted to build something that looks like this. I wanna put a chart in here. Well, there is no, you're not gonna find, like HTML doesn't have a chart type. That won't work. There, there is no such thing. Um, but what, H, what HTML does have, it has this thing called a canvas. So the idea behind a canvas is, um, a canvas is a place where you can draw graphics. You can do 2D or 3D graphics. So imagine that it's a rectangle. In this case here, there's a little bit of code that's just filling the whole uh, canvas with green. You can draw anything you want on the canvas and you do it with JavaScript. So the canvas is really neat because it lets you build lots of things that there, there just isn't anything in HTML that lets you do this. You wanna build a video game or you wanna build a chart, or you wanna build a map, or you want to build um, some 3D viewer for um, a molecule or something like that. You can do all of those things. Uh, and you can get, you know, you can, um, you can build really complex, um, really complex kinds of graphics to do uh, virtual reality or whatever. And there's lots of libraries that let you do this. Like for example, um, for, for doing like 3D graphics, you can use um, a library like 3JS, which lets you draw to a canvas and do uh, 3D style graphics. Um, I haven't checked any of these. And so like, let's see. Yeah, so this is in a browser. It's not a video. It's just this rendered uh, 3D graphic that's happening. And it's all happening inside of a canvas that I can interact with, like I can change it. Very, very cool. So I'm gonna use a library called Chart.js. There are thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions. I, I don't know what the number is. There are so, so many JavaScript libraries that will do things for you, automatically create things for you. And I'm gonna use Chart.js to be able to create a bar chart. I wanna put a chart in here and I wanna have it draw it for me automatically. So in order to use this library, what I have to do is I have to uh, load, let me go back here. I have to load this script from, a, from an external source. So here, here's what the file looks like. Uh, let's look at this one here. So here's the JavaScript file. It's a big, big, it's just a bunch of functions. It's a whole bunch of functions for, that somebody has written that let you do, that let you create charts. 
pie charts, line charts, scatter plots, histograms, all kinds of stuff. So it's a huge big piece of code. And what I want to do is I want to I want to use this in my uh, in I want to use this in my website. Okay, so I'm going to use the exact same concept that we just used here. So instead of writing a greeting function, imagine that I have a function like chart and chart takes uh, some options and then um, it's going to draw a chart from those options. So I'm not going to write the chart function. I'm going to use the chart function that somebody else has written and then it's going to do it in my page for me. Okay, so let's figure out how we include this in our page. So what I have to do is I have to include this file, this chart.js file in my project. So I'm gonna go back to my HTML. Let's delete all this. And I'm gonna put a script tag in here. So this is uh, include an external chart library. So we're gonna say script source equals, and then I'm gonna paste that URL like so. So nothing is happening yet. It hasn't, it hasn't done anything yet. And the reason it hasn't done anything yet is because I'm not using the functions. So I'll show you, I'll prove to you that it's working. If I go to my network diagnostics here and I reload this, you'll see that it's loading my web page. This is the web page, the HTML. Uh, it's loading my little bit of, of CSS. It's loading my image. Uh, this is the image that it's loading. And it's also loading this chart.js JavaScript. Okay, so the, the function is there, but I'm not using it yet. So let's figure out how we use this thing. So usage, how do you, how do you use this? Well, we have to write code that looks like this. So we have to create a new chart and we have to tell it where we want the chart to be drawn. Okay, so let's let's create a canvas element. So I'm gonna, so this is an element, element to use for drawing the chart. So I'm gonna create a canvas element and I'm gonna give it a name. I'm gonna call it chart. And I'm not gonna put anything inside it. So a canvas is not a place where you put text. A canvas is a place where you draw things using code. Okay, so I have a canvas and if I, if I load this right now, again, you can't see anything. Like there's a canvas here, but I haven't drawn to it yet. I haven't done anything with it yet. Okay, so let's figure out how to do what we wanna do. So I'm going to now, I need to use the charting library. How do I do that? So according to the instructions, what I have to do is I have to make a new chart. So whenever you see this, we know that chart must be a constructor function, right? Because it has a capital C, just like we've been learning about. And you can see that they're using the new keyword. So the simplest way to make a chart here would be to say, let chart equals new chart. And then I'm going to pass into this the name of my canvas. The ID of my canvas is chart. And then it wants me to pass in a whole bunch of options. So what we're going to do here is we're going to pass in a bunch of options. So right now I'm going to leave the options empty, which probably won't work, but let's try that. So we go here and I have a chart, but there's nothing there's no data and there's no errors. It's so it's, it's drawing something, but there's nothing to draw. So let's do a little bit more work. What else can we do with the chart? Well, the, the next thing we can do is we can tell it which type of chart to draw. And there's all kinds of different types of charts, line charts, bar charts, radar charts, uh, donut and pie charts, bubble charts, scatter. So you can pick Let's just do a line or a bar chart. So what we have to do is we have to say that the type of chart that we want to draw is a bar chart. So I'm going to do that here. I'm going to go and I'm going to put in a option. I'm going to say type is equal to bar. Okay. So now we've got the beginnings of a bar chart. 
So this is very cool. So I don't have any data in here yet and there's no labels, but you can see that my canvas has been filled up with a grid. So I've got the beginnings of a chart and all I had to do was write this code here. How does this code work? This code wouldn't work if I deleted this line of code here. And if I save this, it's not gonna work. I'm gonna get an error. The error says chart is not defined. I'm trying to call this chart function and it says there is no chart function. Like whatever you're doing here, it doesn't make sense because you've never defined a chart function. There isn't a chart function in JavaScript. What I have to do is I have to, I have to include an external JavaScript file that defines a chart. And so that's what that's what's happened here. So now I have a chart that's being defined. Okay, what do we what do we do next for a bar chart? We have to give our data and we have to give a bunch of options. Okay. So the data let's let's go through and uh, put in some data. So data is an object that I have to put in and I need a comma here. So in my data, I'm going to um, put in some labels. And the labels, it's an array of, of labels. So my labels are going to be just like January, February, March, I'm gonna say unknown. And I'm gonna say under 19. And then I'm gonna do 20 to 29, 30 to 39, 40 to 49 etc. 50 to 59, 60 to 69, and um, 90 plus. So if I save this, I now have all of these at the bottom here. I have all the different categories being placed in the age categories are putting in here, but I don't have any data yet. Okay, so we need to put that data in. And the way that it wants me to do that is I have to define a data set. And the data set is an array of Data, I'm just gonna put one data set in here. So I need, um, the data is going to look like this. Uh, it's an array and the numbers are 1, 11, 15, 37, 30, 27, 15, 7, 13, and 10. Okay, so now I've got bars in here, but I need to do a few other things. Uh, one thing I don't like is I don't like the color. So I'm gonna say that the background color is light blue. So now I've got bars in the right color. And the other thing I don't like is I don't like how it's saying undefined for this label. So I'm gonna say that the uh, label is cases by age group, like that. Okay, that's good. So now I could do lots of other things. There's all sorts of other things I could do. I could set the border color for things. I could do labels for each things. I could do things with the X and Y axis. There's all sorts of options that I have available to me. None of these things are really what I wanna talk about today. Because what I wanted to show is I wanted to show how I can um, link an external JavaScript file and then I can use it in my own code. If I wanted to improve this a little bit more, why don't we move this out of the HTML file, out of here, and let's, let's load it in um, script.js. So I'm gonna save this and I'm gonna go over here and I'm gonna put that code in here like so. So this is going to be um, include, include a local 
uh, script that uses chart.js. Okay. So here it is down here being used. So what I've done is I've kept my HTML only about the markup. I'm not doing anything in here that is related to um, JavaScript. I keep my HTML in one file, my JavaScript in another file. Some of the JavaScript I have written, some of the JavaScript I'm getting from another library that I'm including in my own. If I were to, uh, another mistake that you could, you could make is if I were to move this file my local file, if I loaded it first, look what happens. I get an error. It says chart is not defined. So the reason that happens is because this code is trying to use the chart function, but the chart function doesn't get loaded until after I use it. So the order that you put things in is going to matter. So here I'm going to go back and I'm going to put this after like so. and now it works again. So when you're working on putting these scripts in, pay attention to that. Okay, so I have put this up on GitHub and I'll give you a link so that you can go and get the code and you can try this out yourself and you can play around with working with uh, different media types, tables, scripts, and so on. We're gonna use all of these techniques a lot in upcoming assignments and you'll have a chance to play with them uh, extensively.